All right. I hope you guys are doing well. So we're going to talk a little bit about today uh, the entertainment 1920s. So something that's uh, you know been emer well that was emerging in the 1920s that many Americans loved, and uh, that's with silent movies and eventually movies that had sound and then animations, things like that. So real quick, bell ringer for today. There it is. Describe how entertainment emerged in the 1920s. How are people informed about politics, sports, products, and entertainment? I'll give you some time. Pause the video. Write you down your response. <clears throat> okay, so describe how entertainment emerged in the 1920s. A lot of that had to do with, uh, you know, these new urban areas, these modernist society, okay, where... Um, industries through the progressive era weren't regulated to work. You know, people weren't regulated to work uh, hours on end. Okay, so now there's the strict timetable, I guess you could say, where people would work around eight hours on average, come home, and they'd have to find something to do. And a lot of the entertainment focused around sports, okay, shows, uh, people going out to bars, you know, you name it, listening to music. Okay, there's a lot of new. Uh, forms of entertainment and activities for people to do. Um, one important one, which I thought was interesting, uh, I read about was flagpole sitting. So people in the 1920s thought it was a good idea. Well, let's just climb up the flagpole and sit up there. All right, someone will time us and see how long we can sit up on top of the flagpole. And that was just some sort of weird activity people liked to, you know, well, like to partake in back in the 1920s. It's almost like, I guess, Planking. I know planking was a big thing not too long ago where people would just go around and plank on different things like a desk or a railing. I don't know, a chair, who knows. But flagpole sitting was something that some people did. I, I didn't understand. I don't really understand the things of it, but there in the idea of it, but that's what people did. But sports, especially, right? And this reached out to the American people through magazines, through radio broadcasts, newspapers. Okay, posters, you name it. Okay, this is the way they advertise for their different forms of entertainment. Okay, and like I said, how are people informed? Magazines, newspapers, radio broadcasts. Okay, and there's different companies making sure that people uh, were given this type of entertainment and that could understand it and have fun with it. And it was just another outlet for people um, to partake in after, after work. All right, so there you have it. That's the bell ringer for today. So, again, this is the last day of the week. So, turn in your bell ringers and uh, make sure that you have those, have those turned in. Let's see if there's any vocab terms for today. All right. So, we will go over the jazz singer. And mm, that's really it. Yeah. Okay. So, jazz singer is your only vocab term for today. Jazz singer. All right, so let's move on today. Hope you enjoyed the Babe Ruth video yesterday. It just shows how larger than life he really was and how many American people knew him more than their public officials. Right? And like how, how famous these people were getting through entertainment. And it really became America's, I guess you could say, pastime, their backbone, right? Through sports, through entertainment, where people love to part you know, partake in what's going on and paying money to watch these 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 events and uh, taking note of the teams and players and it was pretty it, it was it was something that obviously we know today as you know things that we really enjoy and it hasn't really changed too much um, obviously things like gambling and fantasy teams uh, where you pick your own players and stuff like that has emerged but um, yeah, sports and entertainment was huge back in the 1920s because this is when it was first emerging in the lifestyle of America. All right, Lindbergh's flight. Here we go, Lindbergh's flight. Uh, this was something very interesting in the 1920s. As we know, in World War I, okay, the airplanes were used, but it was very limited, right? Uh, this was the first, I guess you say, beginning of, of, uh, of airplanes being used and how it was really revolutionary. Okay, how this was a huge change because in 1903 was when the first airplane took off. It only flew about 100 yards. Right? Yeah, I won't even say it flew. It was just kind of gliding. 
But in World War One, in a in a few, I say 14, 12 years, right? Uh, the plane has really transformed to this battle machine, right? And it only can go short distances. and won't be able to go in the, in, the, in the air for very long, as you know, with the Flyboys. Okay, we watched that movie. That was pretty much how how these planes were used in World War One. And then all of a sudden, 1920s, a man by the name of Charles Lindbergh thought, well, let's just take a plane across the whole Atlantic Ocean. We know how long the Atlantic Ocean is, how far it is. So that was his goal. That was his objective. And he did it. He was the first American, first person to fly nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean. So he started in New York City and flew all the way to, I think it was close to Paris, France. Yeah. And uh, Lindbergh made this trip. It took 33 hours. Okay. And uh, his airplane was called the Spirit of St. Louis. So make sure you remember that. It's going to be an interesting fact. Uh, it's going to be a question, maybe on a test or a quiz, and Charles Lindbergh and how he made this flight. He was so popular, so famous throughout the world uh, because he made this trip across the Atlantic Ocean that everybody thought it was uh, pretty much it was a, a, a task that could never be done, a feat that could never be accomplished. But he did it. And uh, a unique story, which you can look up on your own, is his ransom with his child. Okay, someone came into his his house, dead of the night, and uh, and uh, he took they they took his his child and they left a ransom for him to pay because they knew how famous and popular he was. And I don't think his child ever made it back home, unfortunately. All right, entertainment and arts. So even before sound, movies offered. Means of escape through romance and comedy. So first sound movie was The Jazz Singer. So at, at a time there was movies that just didn't have sound at all. It was just clips and people went and enjoyed and watched it and they can kind of fill in their mind how people would talk, how they would explain things. And with Charlie Chaplin, which I'll share a video here, a famous comedian, uh, he would just kind of go about and fall and stumble over things. And uh, it, was, it was unique and funny at the time. And he would look a certain way, which made a lot of people laugh. And uh, there would be bands inside the theater that would play to try to match what was going on with his kind of rumbling around and, and falling over things. That was interesting. But first sound movie, they called them talkies, Jazz Singer, 1927. Then the first animated with sound was Steamboat Willie, Disney, Mickey Mouse, right? Mickey Mouse. So by 1930, millions of Americans went to the movies each week. Okay. Obviously now with COVID-19, not many people are doing that um, because you can't. Um, but I enjoy the movies. I love going to the movies. I know that you know people pirate films nowadays, and you can pretty much watch any type of movie at home in the comfort of your home through Apple TV or whatever it might be. But I still love going to the movie theaters and uh, you know having fun with that. But anyway, Walt Disney's Steamboat Willie, Mario debut of Mickey Mouse, seven minute long black and white cartoon. I'll share the. The, the cartoon with you uh, to this post as well. I think you'll enjoy it. All right, music and art. Last thing I want to go over. Yep. Uh, so different forms of artwork were emerging, especially from the urban areas, these cities. Okay, now that the progressive era was coming to a close, uh, many Americans, again, not working in these harsh conditions for long hours. Uh, you know, writers, composers, poets, uh, artists, they all were taking note and, and painting different types of sceneries around the cities. And at this time, many people had no idea, especially in the rural areas, what these cities actually looked like. So this artwork was really kind of shaping what was going on in these cities and, and how it was, the nightlife, okay, and how lifestyle was a little bit more fast-paced in these cities. And uh, this was something that, again, was first emerging now. In the late 1800s going up in the 1900s so many people in these rural areas grew, drew, uh, grew a fascination of the artwork the poetry the music and the lifestyle in these larger cities and that's kind of what you see here again a person living out in the middle of a rural you know area get out in a farm they would see this picture and be like wow what is that a sky you know, they had no idea what a skyscraper was a tower building and now they're painting these things and kind of expressing what it kind of looks like in these cities. And it's amazing, you know, how, how, how big of a change this is, just not many miles away in these urban areas. All right, so there you have it. Uh, don't worry about these names here. 
when I get into some of these these riders of the 1920s, that's what I like you know. Okay, that's all I got for today. Um, I'm going to share videos, like I said, Steamboat Willie and Charlie Chaplin to the post. See you guys. Have a good one.